say democracy is a system or an idea, something that can be experienced but never seen. But for close to 100 years, millions of Indians saw democracy in this building, the old parliament house, these massive sandstone columns, the two cramped chambers of Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, the countless debates and bills, all of it makes you go, wow. Maybe it's the history associated with this building. It has seen colonialism, the freedom movement, the Second World War, our independence. Imagine if those walls could tell stories. This episode would have been a lot longer. But like a battle-weary soldier, the old parliament has retired. After all, 96 years is a long time. India's lawmakers have shifted to this new building. It's bigger and more state-of-the-art. But it has big shoes to fill. Today, we are looking back at the history of India's old parliament. When was it built? Who designed it? And why is it shaped the way it is? Time for a flashback. Our story begins in 1911. Britain's King George V was in Delhi. He was to be crowned the Emperor of India. And this wasn't a new tradition. There had been two imperial darbars before this, in 1877 and 1903. But this one was different. Because in 1911, the king came to attend. After the ceremony ended, it was time for him to speak, and he surprised everyone. King George announced that India's capital was being shifted. It was in Calcutta until then, what is called Kolkata now. It would now be in Delhi. Now, this posed a challenge. Delhi had been largely ignored by the British after the 1857 revolt. How would this neglected city become a capital? Clearly, it needed a facelift. Two architects were roped in for this job, Edwin Luttins and Herbert Baker. Both were British architects. They were also longtime friends and colleagues. Their brief was quite straightforward. Design the new imperial capital. In 1912, that meant two things. One was the government house, what we know as the Rashtrapati Bhavan now. It is the residence of India's president. The second was the government secretariats, the North and South blocks. Only these two constructions were part of the original plan. The parliament came later. In 1919, the Government of India Act was passed. The idea was to put more Indians in the government machinery. So a big parliament was needed. Baker and Latins got cracking again. They had different ideas about the building. Baker wanted a triangular design. Latins wanted a circular one. And no spoilers here. It is clear that Latins won that battle. He also argued about the location. Baker wanted it away from Raisana Hill. Luttins wanted the current location. Again, Luttins won. These arguments tested their friendship. Things nearly broke down between both the men. But in the end, the plan was set. The parliament would be circular with pillars all around, 144 of them. What inspired this design? Well, we don't know for sure. But historians talk about two theories. One, it looks like the Colosseum. Very grand and very imposing. Maybe that inspired Luttins and Baker. And second, a temple in Madhya Pradesh, the Chaucer Yogini Temple. If you compare the pictures, the similarity is uncanny and locals believe it did inspire the parliament. Unfortunately, there is no proof. We don't know if Baker or Luttins ever saw this temple. But here's what we do know. Neither man was a fan of Indian architecture. Both Baker and Luttins thought Western architecture was superior. And nothing surprising there, just typical colonial attitude. Their design reflects that. The old parliament has very few Indian elements. It was mostly a white man's vision. Either way, the blueprint was fixed. It was now time to build it. In February 1921, the foundation stone was laid by this man, Prince Arthur. He was the third son of Queen Victoria. The construction would take around six years. More than 2,500 stone cutters were employed. They had just one job, cut and shape the stones. The pillars were the most unique part of it. They were made from sandstone. Each one is 27 feet high. We also know how much it cost. The whole project was around 83 lakh rupees. That's 83 lakh rupees in the 1920s, so it is a lot of money. In January 1927, it was ready for inauguration. Viceroy Irvin arrived in a special carriage. He was handed a golden key by Herbert Baker. Irvin unlocked the doors and along with it, history. Back then, the building housed three chambers, the Council of States, the Chamber of Princes, and the Assembly. In just two years, the building's foundation was shaken. So was that of the British Raj. Bhagat Singh and Batukeshwar Dutt 
threw bombs at the assembly. They dropped pamphlets calling for revolution. They read, it takes a loud voice to make the deaf hear. And the deaf did hear. But around 17 years later, until 1947, the parliament building was the Imperial Legislative Council. So when did it become the Parliament of India? A few years later, in August 1947, the transfer of power took place. The British handed over control to India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru. This happened in the old Parliament building, inside the Central Hall. This hall would also host India's Constituent Assembly. You know the things from your history books? All of them happened here. Nehru's speech about India's tryst with destiny, the famous Constituent Assembly debates, the adoption of India's constitution, the Central Hall witnessed all of it. At one point, the Supreme Court sat in the old parliament. We mentioned the Chamber of Princes. This chamber was used by the Supreme Court between 1950 and 1958. Imagine the power of one building, two houses of parliament and the Supreme Court. In 1952, India's first general election was held. We needed space for hundreds of MPs. The old State Council became the Rajya Sabha. The old Central Legislative Assembly became the Lok Sabha. And the Chamber of Princes? It became a library of sorts, a reading room for Indian lawmakers. But pretty soon, we had to expand. India's democracy was outgrowing its parliament, so the chambers were extended. Seating area was increased, and two extra floors were added in 1956. But even then, it was difficult. Some MPs had to sit behind pillars to join the proceedings. In simple words, it was congested. Despite that, work continued. There were debates, bills and walkouts. If you think about it, the story of India is the story of that building. War, separatism, emergency, nuclear bombs, statehood, everything happened in those chambers. Some good, some bad, but all of it important. One thing worth pointing out is the 2001 attack. Pakistan-backed terrorists breached the parliament premises. They had cars with fake Home Ministry stickers. All the MPs escaped unheard, but nine others lost their lives. It was an attack unlike any other, because the target was not just people or objects, the target was Indian democracy. But as always, the parliament survived and thrived, both the building and the institution. So why did India build a new one? Why not create more history with the same building? The government says the old one is in distress and it's hard to argue with that. The building is almost 96 years old. But like that famous Hollywood dialogue, it's old, not obsolete. The old building has gotten a name change. It is now Samvidhan Bhavan, meaning Constitution House. There is talk of turning it into a museum, a museum of democracy. But whatever happens, the old parliament can be proud of its career. It began as an imperial council. It retired as the seat of the world's largest democracy, the embodiment of a proud country.